What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Larry Rifkin, John Kropsik for another episode of America Trends. And damaged as we are, John, we are crawling back to our audience today. That's true. And we have to be humble about this because all of us really are flawed individuals and we're kind of a product of all of our experiences. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people in our audience, a shockingly high number who in some way experienced a lot of trauma when they were young. And if we look at the numbers, 75% of us experienced some life-changing adversity before the age of 20. I think I think it's higher. I think higher than I, that. I think it's higher than that. Yeah, I do. I think really three out I of think, four. I that's think, not I high think, enough. I, yeah, I think it's higher though. I think Why do you think that? I think everybody experiences. I mean, you experience. Death is a, is a problem. Okay, so a death a of a parent yeah. or a uh, sibling or even a grandparent? Know, I mean, and, is and, that and, really... And look at the amount of divorce, you know, that okay. kids are putting All up right, with. All right, that adds to the mix, uh, clearly. Know, I mean, more than when we were, you know. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I think the, the numbers are really a lot higher than that. Well, I mean. you look at emotional abuse. Uh, you look at bullying, right. uh, you look at uh, violence in a family, right. you look at alcoholism, uh, perhaps sexual uh, dysfunction in terms of, uh, you know, being taken advantage of by an adult. I mean, there's a lot that's going on in our society that we just don't want to think about, and yet it affects so many of us, and it changes the way we look at life as adults. And I think also we have this... Uh, this uh, five-minute news cycle where we're constantly been bombarded with bad stuff where, you know, when we were kids, you know, you had the six o'clock news. That was the only thing. Yeah, and yeah, that's a good point. You know, it's constant. It's yeah. constant. It's on your phone. It's on your computer. It's it's everywhere. So I, I don't know. I think kids, especially today, are, are really in a, in a much tougher environment than well, it's interesting because in the course of the conversation that we had with Dr. Meg Jay, who has written the book Super Normal, The Untold Story of Adversity and Resilience, if you recall, I said, you know, I don't think that I had any of these terrible experiences as a child. I had wonderful parents and they were together. Now, my dad died when I was 19. And he was only 47, a congenital heart problem and open heart surgery was just too risky at the time. But I didn't include that because I felt, well, I had grown up by then. I was in college. So he had given me the base that I needed. But maybe I should have considered that. But I did consider that when we moved back, we lived in Connecticut, then moved to Florida. I loved Florida, but my parents chose to move back after five years. And I will tell you that moving back to Connecticut, at least in fifth grade with the teacher that I inherited back here in Connecticut, who was not real gentle on me, even though I was, you know, doing well in Florida, she would point that out, but in a way that was meant to needle me. Right. And it was a really tough year for me. We weren't living in our own place. We were living with one of my aunts. But she said, uh, Dr. J, that that would not necessarily qualify as well, one of those traumatic things. But traumatic. I know it had an impact yeah, on it's me. It's still traumatic. Yeah. yeah. In, in its own way. And I don't want to trivialize some of the serious things that go on in people's lives. And they really have to work a lot in their adult lives to have overcome that which they experienced right, as a child. Right. It's just, it's a tough world. It really is. It's a tough world. To, and I think social media is not, not helping it too much at all, especially with kids Oh, absolutely. Exacerbating whatever it is that right. their weakest link may be in their lives and somebody trying to exploit that. John, did you feel that you had what would be called a, a normal childhood? No, I definitely didn't. I, you know, my dad died, same thing, of a heart attack when I was, uh, 
how old was I? Thirteen, mm. and that was very traumatic. And then you know, every you know, we kind of my mother kind of couldn't handle us, and uh, she had her hands full with four four of us boys. So, so it was not anything but normal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I mean, how have you overcome that? I mean, you have a wonderful family, and uh, you've got uh, your sons and your daughter. Uh, I mean, and what did you try to do in relation to well, your own growing up uh, it, to make certain that their pathway was pretty I, I clear? I think I learned from that, though. You know, I learned, you know, how I wanted to treat my kids. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to meet my wife, Young. So, you know, it was... Uh, it, it's a it's a learning. I mean, it's a lifelong learning. You're learning constantly, but I think I learned from that. Well, Dr. Meg J is going to be joining us, and she does a great job of uh, laying all of this out. And uh, we're all in this mix. And of course, as we talk about uh, the numbers of people who have been affected by these various traumatic events growing up, she tells us that you can overcome them. And she introduces us to a lot of people who have, and a lot of them are celebrities. I've got to tell you, though, I was listening to a conversation on radio recently, and it was with uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Okay. And I found it very interesting because he was talking about his childhood. And, of course, comedians always like to bring up right, right. their childhoods. And they use they it as have great, great childhoods. Yeah, great fodder. <laughs> they always do. But he was really uh, talking about his relationship with his dad. And he said that his dad would have been a better comedian than him. Huh. And that, ironically, when his dad died, there was some relief because he actually felt that he didn't have to compete in his mind with his father any uh -huh. longer. And I know that sounds odd. Yeah. And it certainly wasn't something that I was looking for when my dad died. But I did feel like I had to leave broadcasting aside because I, I thought of him because he was a broadcaster right. in the highest regard. And I didn't want to be compared to him at that time. And it took me some time to come back to broadcasting, feeling that enough time, space, and distance uh, had occurred so that I could claim my own space and not always be comparing myself to my dad. I, I did. Yeah. yeah that's, it that's was interesting. interesting. Well, in this book, Super Normal, she points to people who have overcome trauma and used it to their advantage, including LeBron and Oprah and Beyonce, all people seemingly you have only one name so i don't know what that means john <laughs> but i'm sure we'll find out so why don't we go to this really Let's interesting conversation with dr meg j we are on with dr meg j and the book is called super normal the untold story of adversity and resilience and i've got to say that uh, this is an issue that i've been thinking about a lot lately and at my Thanksgiving table recently, Dr. J, I wanted you to know that I said that I was grateful for just the kind of normal childhood that I was afforded. And it was a wonderful childhood. Uh, and it was full of lots of joy and very little stress in the way that I know so many others uh, are filled with these days. And you tell us that about 75% of the people who grew up in our society uh, find that they had some kind of traumatic event before the age of 20. That seems a little That's startling. Right. Yes. Um, so you're so you're officially in a minority there mm -hmm. if, if you don't fall into that category. It, it is startling because I think when we think about adversities, we think about them one at a time. So, you know, that I won't rattle off the 10 most common adversities, but they range from losing a parent or a sibling through death or divorce or having an alcoholic parent or a mentally ill sibling or uh, bullying. Um, and so each of those affects just a small-ish group, you know, 5% here, 20% there. But when you group them all together under the umbrella of childhood adversity, 75% of children and teens will face one of these or more by the age of 20. I think when I do reflect on this, maybe I've been just a little too casual about the definition. Because the one thing that was traumatic to me, and I'm wondering how this affects a lot of kids, was the fact that we moved, and only twice, but coming back to Connecticut. Uh, I found it very difficult because I didn't want to come back. My parents came back for reasons other than, uh, you know, my uh, direct pleasure. And uh, that really affected me, I guess, uh, is moving and that kind of dislocation part of this. 
Um, you know, I did not include that in my book, and I, you know, I really stuck with what are, for the most part, the ACEs, the the you know adverse childhood experiences that are, you know, generally used in research. And so, like I said, that's you know substance abuse in the home, domestic violence in the home. So they're generally about dysfunction in the home or maybe sexual abuse outside of the home, a community member. Um, I did include bullying in there, although that's not on the list, but. I have had clients for whom they moved often in childhood or they moved at a particularly different, difficult time, and it was difficult for them. It was an adversity. Um, and so, you know, there's no hard and fast list of where adversity begins and ends. It really depends on the situation. And when we do look at the impacts of this as we go into adulthood, I'm just curious as to what you see uh, for those who were not able to overcome uh, to prove that they are super normal, as the title of your book suggests. Uh, what are some of the, the downsides and what are some of the implications of this as we enter into adulthood? Well, most of the childhood adversities that I mentioned are chronic stressors. So they're not one-time events. They're not tornadoes. They're not hurricanes. They're not car accidents, although those could be included as adversities, but they're not the ones I'm talking about. So um, kind of family dysfunction, community dysfunction, these are chronic stressors that kids and teens live with day after day, often year after year. So what that means is that millions of youth are living in a low level of fight or flight, and that overexposes you to your own stress hormones, which then puts you at risk for all sorts of negative outcomes because it has a negative impact on your brain and your body. So we're talking about school failure, behavior problems, underemployment, substance abuse issues, mental health problems, chronic disease, even early death. And so people who are resilient, who I'm calling supernormal in my book, Supernormal, um, they don't, for the most part, they seem to beat the odds and that their lives turn out better than expected given the chronic stress they grew up with. It doesn't mean that they're perfect people who are problem-free. That's one of the misunderstandings about resilience. But it does mean that they seem to have, their lives seem to have taken a better turn than one would have expected. And you suggest that in certain ways, these individuals having overcome adversity at a very young age, that they develop these survival skills that give them some unique uh, looks at life and uh, ability uh, to rise above the normal uh, din of our existence. Yeah, I think that um, something that is useful for my clients I have found to, to recognize is I think there's a tendency to focus on what's gone wrong in life or when we've been hurt, and maybe we need a little bit of help focusing on how we got through it and to realize that being resilient is really about being courageous, it's about being strong, it's about getting out there and fighting for a better life for yourself. And I think many people who have been through adversity and have come out on what feels like the other side feel like, you know, I'm stronger than I was before. I'm more capable or more confident about meeting the next um, difficulty that comes my way. And along the way, many um, develop some pretty interesting survival skills in terms of being scrappy, in terms of being good at reading situations, um, in terms of, you know, developing a pretty healthy self-control um, because they can't really take their environment for granted. And so then when they get to adulthood, a lot of things that young adults are experiencing for the first time, a lot of stressors or difficult complicated situations. Kids who've been through some hard times, they've seen a lot of it before. You call the book Super Normals, and like superheroes, uh, we know that they have their own origin stories. How much do they have to grapple with those stories, uh, going to therapy or really resolving in their own minds uh, what did occur during childhood and addressing it uh, with those involved or not. But how important is that for them to overcome uh, what it is that that trauma might have uh, uh, put in their way? Right. Well, there's actually a great New Yorker cartoon. If this weren't radio, we could flash it up for everyone to see, but it's a picture. It's like a, you know, a hand-drawn picture of, of Batman who's looking out the window and he's holding like a handheld tape recorder and it says memoir, chapter one, page one. And then his, his first sentence says, sometimes I'm not sure. I think maybe I've never gotten over the death of my parents. <laughs> 
and that it's such a great, <laughs> and it should have been the cover of my book, um, that it's really, the book is really about so many people out there, super normal as I'm calling them, because to me, resilience is a heroic endeavor, and many people grow up to be really amazing um, people, amazing characters, yet they have an origin story that really never goes away. They have a backstory that many people would never guess if they haven't been told, and often the backstories are a secret. Do you think that the two-thirds number, or the, uh, I should say, three-fourths number, 75 percent, is something that is reflected in cultures across the world, or is America particularly prone to uh, trauma and adversity at a young age? What, what, has anyone studied this across uh, the various uh, countries? You know, I'm sh- yes, they have, and no, we're not. It's not worse here than other places. That there have been many studies around the world where, you know, it's a pretty solid two-thirds to three-quarter numbers. And, of course, you'd find some pockets in the world where it's much higher, maybe some where it's lower. But um, I think that, you know, hardship is to be expected. And it's interesting that we imagine, you know, what's a normal childhood as one that has no problems, when statistically speaking, that's actually not what's normal. Um, that that's that's not the, that's not the norm. Do you think that America has established enough in the way of understanding all of this and encouraging therapy and trying to help people grapple with what it was that occurred in childhood? Have we done enough or are we beginning to recognize that we haven't? For example, with this whole issue of uh, sexual abuse, of course, uh, if you right. want to put that one in the uh, focus, uh, let's uh, you know look at that. Sure. Well, that was really why I wrote Supernormal. It's because I don't think everyone needs to, nor do I think it's feasible for you know everyone to go get a therapist. Um, but I do think that conversations about adversity and about trauma need to be brought out into the open, that keeping secrets, we know it's, it's bad for your health, um, and it leaves you feeling alienated from people around you and feeling alone, which is also bad for your health. So I do think we need to do more to bring these conversations into the public realm so that people can see that, you know, having a problem-free life is not the norm and you are not abnormal if something bad has happened to you. Um, And that's a big hurdle with a lot of my clients is they feel like, well, I'm coming to a therapist because I'm damaged, I'm abnormal because this thing happened to me. And that's been, I think, the power of the Me Too movement, which is really, its I mean, it speaks for itself. It says, hey, we're all in this together. You're, you're far from alone. When you look at the various uh, forms of trauma uh, that can occur in childhood, is there any one that you have found as a clinical psychologist is perhaps the most difficult to wrestle with as an adult? You know, I'm so glad you asked that question because a lot of people ask that, which means that you know, we need to get the word out that you may be surprised to know that there there's no hierarchy of trauma, that uh, clients do have a tendency, people do have a tendency to compare trauma, and they'll often sit at my office and say, well, I had this, but, you know, I haven't been in a war, or this other thing didn't happen to me, and actually the brain doesn't differentiate between one kind of danger and stress and another kind of danger and stress. It just knows that something stressful or threatening is happening. So, you know, we really shouldn't bother comparing adversities either. Um, And partly also because every situation is different. So, you know, divorce is on the list of the most common childhood adversities, and for but not every uh, divorce is an adversity, but not every divorce is a good divorce either. And so, um, it, you know, often is a matter of degrees. So we don't have a hierarchy, but if something is prolonged, if something starts at a certain age and continues unabated for a period of time, is that normally uh, more difficult to deal with than a one-time occurrence, perhaps? Right. So, yes. Yeah, so it's probably the three or four factors that kind of have an impact on how um, how much of an impact the adversity has is how young we are, when it begins, how long it goes on, uh, how much support we have or how little support we have throughout, 
you know, our own genetic uh, contributions um, and whether or not the perpetrator, if there is a perpetrator in this particular kind of adversity, is a trusted person or a stranger can also have an impact. And in what way? Uh, well, uh, in some cases, for example, you know, being harmed, being abused, being sexually assaulted by people that we know can be more damaging and even more difficult to process than um, those things happening by people we don't know. But again, you know, we can't rank uh, adversities. But just that it, it does more to, it's more difficult to understand to say, you know, I thought that person loved me or I thought I could trust that person. It's more confusing than sometimes when random bad things happen from the outside. Many years ago, I was involved in a television production, a drama that dealt with children of alcoholics. And Mm -hmm. we called it numb uh, because Mm -hmm. that seemed to be what it did to uh, dull the senses of the young person who was uh, finding themselves in harm's way because of a parent uh, who was an alcoholic. Uh, What are the various coping mechanisms? Is being numb to it and trying to turn away from it one of those Mm -hmm. mechanisms? You know, yes. And, you know, there's actually, I boil it down into the book, which in a really kind of easy way to think about it, is that most coping mechanisms really boil down to two things, modern forms of fight or modern forms of flight. And it kind of uh, pegs the the serenity prayer of you change what you can change and you accept what you can't change. And so young people, usually when they're confronted with an adversity, they tend to either fight back, and that may be internally where they decide, I'm not going to let this defeat me. I'm going to find a way out of this. I'm going to get out of this house. I'm going to have a better life. And so the fight, you know, takes a very 21st century form. Um, and But flight is also adaptive. or there, It wouldn't be fight or flight. It would be fight or fight, you know. Mm. So Um, kids find very adaptive, creative ways to flee, often without fleeing. Because like you're saying, in a home with an alcoholic, you can't leave. Um, Although many kids find crafty ways to often be spending the night out or to spend summer somewhere else. But when they're home, they often find ways to leave while they're still there. So whether that's numbing themselves to what's going on or diving into a book or TV shows, that they find ways to remove themselves from the adversity that they can't physically get away from. And that's adaptive. Can we know what percentage, we talked about the up to 75% affected by this adversity in childhood. What about the number of supernormals as opposed to those who actually begin to mimic the behavior that they experienced in childhood? Right. That's difficult to put a number on because some, you know, resilience is adapting well after adversity. And so some people adapt well at work and some people adapt well in relationships and some people adapt well with their mental health and some people adapt well in all of those ways. And so while it's a lot easier to say whether or not we have or haven't had an adversity, resilience is is often a work in progress. But what we do know is that the There are 75% of us out there who are either resilient or working toward it. Um, Some people don't get there um, in terms of adapting well, but, you know, resilient people are all around you hiding in plain sight. Absolutely. And, of course, some of the supernormals that you talk about, you say that they really are marvels and wonders, and many of them are some of the highest achievers in our society, some that are named Oprah Winfrey, uh, LeBron James. Uh, Explain that to us. I mean, do they just uh, really rise so far above uh, their station or their situation uh, that uh, many of us would have a hard time imagining that their childhoods were replete with uh, some of the activities that we talked about. Yes, well, that's why I included several um, descriptions of you know famous people, public figures in the book, from, like you said, Oprah Winfrey to um, Andre Agassi, Viola Davis, Maya Angelou, Howard Schultz of Starbucks. Um, partly, you know, not to say, hey, this is the level of success you need to reach in order to be resilient, but to say, hey, for people out there who are struggling or who came from hard times, 
you're not alone. You're actually in some really good company. But um, if you read what I worked from for these public figures, almost exclusively were their memoirs or their interviews. Um, and I, so I, I read their stories. And what was so interesting was how their stories matched exactly the stories that I heard from my clients, not just in what they'd been through, but in terms of how they managed and how they got out and how they rose above their circumstances. And I wanted readers out there to see that, hey, you know, me too. And what about the stealing effect uh, that they perhaps perfected as children uh, that they used to really motivate them as they became adults? Because you indicate that perhaps those of us who really didn't face some of these hard times um, may not necessarily have some of those skills in adulthood that not that anything that happened to them was a gift but as we look back at it uh, they developed uh, ways to really make themselves even more uh, whole and uh, you know more successful because of it right so the um, the stealing effect that's uh, Michael, Michael Rudder at King's College that's his term for he's looked at a whole host of human and animal studies and found that um, for some people, for some animals, being exposed to intermittent or moderate um, adversities can make you stronger, that it steals you or prepares you for the next difficulty. Um, and there's a, a whole lot of other research that's shown similar, kind of similar outcomes. And one of them was a big study done um, out of SUNY Buffalo, and it was 2,000 adults ages 18 to 101. And they found that people who had grown up with moderate adversity, so not extreme adversity, yet also not no adversity, that the people who would grown up with some adversity were higher functioning and more satisfied than, like I said, people who had grown up with extreme amounts or with no adversity. And I think people who've grown up with some adversity often envy those who've grown up without hardship, um, not realizing that, uh, you know, there may be some benefits in terms of feeling more prepared to face whatever's next in life. We'll return to this episode of America Trends in just a moment. If you like what we're doing here at America Trends Podcast, please don't keep it to yourself. I know there are a lot of people, John, who think, well, if I'm listening and somebody else wants to listen at the same time, maybe we're going to collide and they're not going to be able to hear us. Yeah. Is that the way the technology works? No, there's plenty of bandwidth. Everybody can listen at the same time. All so right. Well, that sure dispels that. that myth. <laughs> now, you can do a number of things that would really be helpful to us. You could give us a kind rating or a review at Apple Podcasts, and that boosts what they consider to be our value and visibility. And what does that do, John? Well, that puts us in the forefront so that you can find us easier, and most important is other people can find us easier. And you can subscribe there or on our site, americatrendspodcast.com, or wherever you're listening, so we can alert you to new episodes of the podcast, which, by the way, we put out twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And stay in touch with us on both Facebook and Twitter at Trends Podcast. Or you can like us on Facebook or follow us where, John? On Twitter. On Twitter. Yeah. That's right. Where the world turns to hear fake news or whatever yeah. it is. Well, Not you can us, direct though. message us news. at Trends Podcast <laughs> or using hashtag Trends Podcast. And, you know, John, with our growing audience, and really it's been pretty remarkable, a lot of people just came to us the last month or two, and they might have missed earlier episodes. Can they get them again? They can look through them and, and uh, pick the ones they want to listen to. They're all on the website, and a lot of them are up on iTunes, many of them. All right. Well, listen, there's lots of material to listen to. We hope you have the time, and we'll lend it to us because we try to make it worth your while. And thanks so much for listening. And tell your friends. We now return to this episode of America Trends. 
Some have said, and this may be, you know, just a kind of common, you know, thought, but uh, really inaccurate as you look at it as a psychologist, that some of the people who find that they have this trauma uh, end up going into situations or relationships that mirror those that they saw in childhood. And it makes it really hard for them then to break away from whatever patterns were established at that time. And yet you tell us that love heals, and it's not easy necessarily for a super normal, but uh, that uh, that means a whole lot if you can find a very healthy relationship as an adult. Yeah, that, that was something that I talk about toward the end of the book, because I do think for many people, relationships or becoming a partner or becoming a parent, I mean, these are very risky, very courageous things to take on, especially if you've grown up in a family where people weren't happy. Um But one thing I learned that I wish I'd learned sooner in my career, uh, actually, is that we hear a lot about the cycle of violence and the cycle of abuse and the cycle of alcoholism and Mm -hmm. the cycle of divorce. And actually, the studies um, that 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 sort of those claims came from, we actually can see now that they weren't that well designed, that the research there is pretty thin. And so what we do know is passed down from parent to child or one generation to the next is risk. Um, for a certain outcome, but what matters at least as much are strengths within the individual, other strengths in the family or in the community. And so it's like if you know that you're at risk for breast cancer or heart disease, if you know that, you might make healthier choices than the average person to be sure that you protect yourself and that men and women do that every day and that breaking the cycle is not only possible, it happens all the time. And what does the society have to do to make itself uh, more whole in this process and more allowing and encouraging for somebody who is trying to break any cycle? What does the community's response have to be? You know, I think uh, empathy goes a long way. That, uh, you know, the book is the untold story of adversity and resilience. And I spend easily half the time talking about adversity, but I think you have to See, understand what people have been through before you can start suggesting solutions. Have you ever been to the doctor and you feel like you've barely finished describing why you came in? They have the prescription pad out there, <laughs> you know, and you think, I'm not sure they really understand my problem. Um, so I think sometimes just beginning with empathy and realizing, knowing what the common adversities are, knowing what the risks are that are involved, um, knowing, you know, how we can help kids or teens or young adults or people of any age talk about these, even if it's just with one or two people, it doesn't have to be in a public setting, that that will do a lot to both educate um, our culture, but also to help people feel less alone and more understood. And that's actually good for your health. Do some of these supernormals try to compensate too much and put too much stress on themselves? You know, I do think that a common profile that you will see is that, and this makes a lot of sense, that the first place people learn to be, to adapt well, to be resilient is at school, and then that transfers well to work. I mean, because those are sort of the available environments when you're a kid. If you're going to kind of scrap your way out of something, you're going to do it by doing well in school or doing well in sports, Um, and then maybe that translates into work or career And then it can get a little bit stuck there Um, and, you know, someone's still in survival mode. They're still in fight or flight mode in terms of feeling like they need to, you know, really be digging in and getting ahead all the time. But um, part of the task for many resilient adults is to then shift from surviving or from striving to thriving. And that usually means including relationships. And that can be, relationships can be the most difficult places to be brave. And why is that? Well, most of the adversities that I mentioned happen in the context of relationships. So somewhere along the way, you know, people are often hurt in the, in the context of loved ones or, or people that they have known. And so, um, it can be difficult to try your hand at relationships again, Um, And also, I think there is that misperception that having had adversity in your life makes you 
abnormal or less than or damaged. And so it can be hard to imagine that people would want to be with you. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to write the book to say, actually, having adversity in your life is not abnormal at all. It's unfortunately quite normal. Recently, I was involved in an opioids uh, panel and conference, and uh, there were some counselors there. And the thing that I walked away with was not the notion that uh, the opioids alone were the problem. Uh, The way that these counselors described it, what really was underlying a lot of these uh, deaths and near deaths as it relates to opioids was the trauma that uh, Mm -hmm. underwrote the lives of the individuals who, in fact, used the opioids uh, to quell the pain. How would you look at that issue? Um, Exactly in the same way that both, and this is something that um, I'm going to, can't guess at the number off the top of my head, but I would say an enormous percentage of people with substance abuse problems have trauma histories. And throughout all of history of mankind, what do we use medicines for? We use them, or what do we use drugs for? Whether it's aspirin or Novocaine or anesthesia, we we use them to dull pain. And so for many people, um, drinking, using opioids, whatever the case may be, is is self-medicating. It's a way, it's an unhealthy way, uh, unhealthy flight response. And so... Um, you know, sometimes the road to resilience that some people who may be resilient in their careers but are still leaning on some unhealthy coping mechanisms, sometimes people on the road to resilience use substances until they find a healthier way to cope. But um, I would say it's extremely common for substance abuse to follow trauma or adversity. In closing, was there anything that really surprised you as you researched and you wrote Supernormal? You know, what surprised me is, and this was actually the same with the previous book that I wrote, is it, I mean, I knew what I was getting into when I wrote it, but it was, would be what other people would ask me. Um, and then I realized it, it, it educated me about what I needed to be sure I talked about in the book. So when I would tell people I was writing a book about adversity and resilience, people would usually say, oh, my gosh, how interesting. Where will you find people to write about? You know, that I'm going to, it sounded like they thought I was going to scour the earth for these people who had, uh, you know, experienced adversity and who were then resilient. And, you know, actually, I would say to them, as I've said to you, they're all around us. They're hiding in plain sight as teachers and doctors and lawyers and neighbors and activists and CEOs that more of us than not have been through something and that many, many people um, who you see or face to face or shoulder to shoulder with every day have been extremely courageous um, and strong to get to where they are. So what's the most important message that you think you could relate to somebody who's listening to this who said, yeah, that's me. I I must be super normal because I overcame some things that uh, I thought perhaps were unique, but many others are doing the same. Uh, But maybe somebody who really hasn't gotten to the heights that they'd like in their adult life, and yet they are working on it. What would you say to them? I would say that you're not alone, that it may not be true that everyone that you meet out there is fighting a hard battle, but as it turns out, a great many people are. All right. Well, I thank you so much for being with us today on America Trends Podcast. Dr. Meg Jay, the book is called Supernormal, The Untold Story of Adversity and Resilience. Thank you so much. Thank you.